So today I think I'm, I'm going to work on a, a little bit softer topic than I often uh, uh, navigate with, um, with uh, technical conferences. So uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Vicki Harp. Um, I am a, uh, a Microsoft employee. I am the uh, GPM for the SQL Server Tools uh, group, and that's the group that's responsible for all of the uh, GUI and non-GUI tools that you use with SQL Server. But prior to that, I was also a, a SQL Server, I've been making tools for SQL Server for about 16 years now, and I've been working with SQL Server since my internship uh, back in uh, late 1999. So over that time, over the course of the last 20 years, really working with SQL Server, I've been in a, a position to navigate change myself, and I've been in a position to navigate change as a manager now. And so I, I thought today I'd spend some time talking about my thoughts on navigating change in what is a very active uh, field and give you some thoughts about how you might approach that yourself, how you might approach that with your team and, and how something like group by can really help you to do this. So if I think back on my career, um, I started uh, right around SQL 2000. So I have I have worked with SQL 7, but my first paid position was working with SQL 2000 um, at the Compact Business Data Reporting Warehouse in, in Houston, Texas in late 1999, early 2000. So this was uh, early versions of SQL 2000 working with Enterprise Manager, et cetera. And then uh, I, I got a job, I was working as a developer, I was doing the DBA work. And uh, ultimately I moved to a company that did monitoring products for SQL Server. And I started there as a uh, support person. And then my first big challenge as I moved into software development and engineering was uh, the development of SQL 2005. So if you uh, have been working with SQL Server for a long time, you know that there was, there was quite a change in, in architecture from SQL 7, SQL 2000 up to SQL 2005. So this was an important release for me. Uh, this was a release where I was able to change quickly. I was able to modify code. I was able to modify the way I worked. I was able to really prove to the people around me um, that I was going to be able to move with the times. And so this was an important lesson for me. And this is something that I share with you now, even though it was a long time ago to say that I would say that my ability to translate my skills between SQL 2000 and SQL 2005 was, was one of the most sentimental moments in my career. And it was a long time ago, and I feel like I still have splash effect from the things I learned at that time about how to move through change. So moving forward in my career, I, I was still working with the same tooling company. And you know, next we had SQL 2008, and then you know, not too long after that, we had SQL 2008 R2. And these, these changes were, were coming at a nice pace. They were coming along where I felt like I had a lot of time to work with them, to get into them and to, to really take classes on them exactly. And I felt like, you know, okay, this is this is a pace I can work with throughout my career. Then along came SQL 2012. And, and this is when I was really starting to get into uh, speaking uh, at out in the SQL community. I was feeling like, okay, whenever I, something new comes out, I should really go out and grab it and be one of the first people to learn about it, be one of the first people who can actually explain how something works. And this again was, was a big moment for me, kind of stepping out of my kind of toiling within my company and getting company credit there and moving out into the community where I was able to interact with the broader SQL community on Twitter, on forums and, and, and in conferences at, at SQL Saturdays and, and at, at past events primarily. And so this was another seminal uh, experience for me was this kind of move into SQL 2012. Since that time, it feels like things have been moving a lot more quickly. So in the next couple years after that, we had SQL 2014, SQL 2016, Azure SQL VM and Azure SQL database uh, on the Microsoft side, as well as offerings on other clouds. And so at this point, you know, we had words, you know, like, you know, Polybase are kind of beginning to float around. We had, um, you know, a lot of different changes in the BI world. We had a lot of uh, new concepts coming out fast and quick, and and the pace of change started to become a little less comfortable than it had been. And then moving forward a little bit further, now we had uh, SQL on Linux, which brought all of these new concepts. We had, I needed to learn about containers, I needed to learn about Linux, and I'd been a Windows developer for all these years. Uh, Kubernetes, I, I didn't even know what Kubernetes was. Uh, so we here we have SQL 2017, and we have Azure SQL Managed Instance. 
And so since at that point, I've actually joined Microsoft. And so now we've moved into the realm of things that have released while I was involved. So uh, one of the first releases that I was involved with was SQL 2019 and the SQL Server Big Data Clusters. And now I'm involved in uh, as well Azure SQL Edge, Azure Arc. And there are other offerings that aren't even on this screen. We have all of these uh, offerings within Azure Data on other data platforms. We have uh, sister technologies around reporting uh, you know, Azure Data Factory, we have all of these changes happening. And I have to say, whenever you see all of these things spinning around here, how does that make you feel? So for me, even being in the position I'm at, at Microsoft, even being very involved with it, I can feel a little bit of a, a stirring of discomfort to say things are changing. They're changing at a rate that I'm not capable of keeping up with. I think overwhelmed would probably be overwhelmed. my marketing brain feeling. <laughs> yes. And so trying to tell that story is just yeah. anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety, yeah. yes. Um, I feel it physically. And like I, I, I can actually, if I get quiet, I can feel even now these little light feelings uh, on like goosebumps almost on my arms of saying, wow, um, I don't know everything about everything that was on that screen. Yeah. So I want to express job, you that, right? And yeah, you feel and that's my job. I feel yeah. responsible. Yeah. And pe people talk about this concept of it being an imposter syndrome. I don't feel that it's an. I don't feel like an imposter. I feel like I am where I need to be, and I do know a lot. But this pace at which I need to learn new things is still quite a lot. It is still quite a lot to to take on. So I, I came across this quote and I wanted to share this. This is from Josh Whiteskin, who is uh, the Searching for Bobby Fischer uh, movie was based on him. He's a, uh, a, a young chess prodigy who, who's now you know, a chess champion. So he says, usually growth comes at the expense of previous comfort or safety. And I saw this and, and it feels unfair, doesn't it? Like it feels like, oh, well, once you've, once you've started growing, once you've reached some sort of point of, of expertise, then you should be safe from there on, right? That, that feels like what it should be, but that's actually not the case. If you reach a point of, of safety and contentedness in a fast moving field like we are in, and you plant your flag there, then as things move forward, you are losing your safety, right? So you're, you're losing your safety because you're not learning and you're not growing, but as you are growing, you're feeling that loss of safety. You're feeling it more than if you decided to stay put. And so I, I want to put that out there to say that, that that's a lot. And I have huge empathy for people and who are navigating this and who don't really um, know how to handle it. So honestly, what this brings up in people is a threat response. So there are three basic limbic threat responses if we're not talking about kind of complicated trauma situations. And so the first one is, is freeze. So I'd say that observationally, quite a lot of people respond to change in their industry with freeze to say, all right, all right, I was with you up until about SQL 2014. And then after that, it started getting a little bit shaky. Uh, I, my, my own industry, we didn't move that quickly. Maybe we're just now getting to SQL 2016. So I'm going to stay where I am and I'm gonna freeze where I'm at and observe and see, you know, what do I need to do next? Another one is, is flee to say, okay, this is too much. This is too much. This is moving too fast for me. I'm not able to keep up. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to choose to move to another field. But another one that I see actually quite a lot in, in our group and, you know, speaking to you, our community, I see fight which is to say, I don't want to change. I'm going to push it away. I'm going to say it shouldn't be happening. And you know, I'd say all of these are natural responses. These are the responses you're going to have um, if you are feeling threatened. Now, some people feel activated by change. They feel excitement. They feel like they, they want to move out and they want to embrace it. But even in those cases, you can still have this underlying threat response to say, I need to move more quickly than others, or I need to seize this. And so there, there can still be a sense of, of disquietude to it. Now, one of the things about these threat responses is that 
generally speaking, not entirely, this is not, this is, this is about internal feelings, but generally speaking, these first two, freezing and fleeing, they don't attend to your needs. They're not going to help you actually grow and change. Um, but they might attend to your values. So they might be, you know, I, I feel like I don't want to be a burden to others. I feel like I want to be um, a kind person. And I feel like I can do that by not forcing others around me to become uncomfortable. Now that, that, that might not get you what you need to be, but you might feel like you're doing the right thing. This last one, fight, it, it kind of reverses. It, it might get you what you need. It might get you into a place of more comfort, but it might not do it in accordance with your values. It might make it where you are now fighting with people that you care about. You are uh, making people who, are, who work with you and who are in your community unhappy. And none of this is entirely necessary. This is something that we can feel and we can move through. And so I wanted to, to put this out there to say that I recognize that there are threat responses to change, but I, I would encourage you to think about feeling those and then seeing if you can move through them to, to a more uh, balanced approach to your needs and your values and see if you can move through it and actually become excited about the change and move into the future. So we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. I'm just reading that directly. It's, uh, it's attributed to Albert Einstein. It's one of those quotes that nobody can quite find where it was written down, so let's know what it is. But, but we think about the, the sorts of things that we might have been feeling and doing whenever we were first getting into data. And then as we were getting settled in our career uh, in data, um, they're not going to solve the new problems that are coming up. So the new problems that are coming up are not the same ones that existed in SQL 2000. SQL 2000 and 2005 had a lot of optimizations that had to do with the speed of disks and, and the expense of disks and the expense of hardware in general and trying to eke every last little bit of performance out of it. And so performance tuning became extremely you know, valuable as a skill and that became something that, you know, knowing all of those internals was really critical to you being able to eke that out. Now, those, we don't have those same problems anymore and we can't solve the problems in the same way. Now with the cloud, it's not that hardware and, and performance are meaningless, but they're becoming more opaque. You know, your awareness of the underlying hardware is not as strong. You don't have as much control over it. Um, it changes quickly, disks are faster, they're bigger. Uh, the speed at which people want data is also different. The scale at which people are operating is different. And the kinds of challenges that people have with their data are no longer simply CRUD operations, you know, create, read, update, and delete. They're also wanting to do machine learning. They're wanting to do AI. They're wanting to do intelligence upon that data. And this is all, they, there are also issues around privacy and data governance that are becoming more urgent. And these are moving you outside of maybe the base capabilities. If you were a DBA in the SQL 2000 through maybe 2008 timeframe, the set of responsibilities and capabilities that you were expected to have is much greater now. Uh, and I, I'd encourage you to think of that as an opportunity. This is something that you can look at as, oh, they're asking so much of me, or you can look at it as, oh, they need me and, and I'm the one that is for you. So I actually want to go back and, and do a little demo here uh, and, and give you some sense of, of how I see things changing from my perspective of, of someone who works in tooling and, and kind of give you a sense of how it is actually getting better, even if it might be uncomfortable. So just for, uh, for history purposes, does anybody remember how you installed the uh, SQL Server tools in SQL 2014 and before? I actually ask anybody wants to answer that. If you had to pick it in the SSMS, I mean, the uh, install package, you had to go down into the tools and pick it yeah, as let an me, option. Let me run this. All right, so let's pull up the SQL 2014 installer here. Let's see how this goes. All right, we're waiting for it to extract. Here it is down here. We're waiting for the process. And uh, yeah, let's just wait here a moment. Like, let's say that this, this was your your VM that you're working on. You, know, this you should go back and talk about the SQL 2000 tools. <laughs> no, seriously. 
<laughs> and so, all right, here we are. So uh, what do we do? So we get the SQL Server data tools. We click on that. Nope, nope, that's not it either. It's, it's opening in a different window here, but uh, that's nope. actually taking us to uh, SSDT. Yes. And that's not, that's not what we're looking for. Uh, so I go over here to tools and no, it's none of these. No, actually what you have to do mm -hmm. is do a new SQL Server standalone installation. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. And then go pick it. Yeah. So let's, yeah. let's, let's go through that. Let's, let's this, really this feel seems it. Fine. Like, this seems fine. This seems fine. Right. All right. So, you know, product key or, you know, is this evaluation or express? Like what, what do you answer here? I'm trying to install the tools. So I'll, okay. I'll go through. Yeah. I'm accepting the license terms for SQL Server. Whatever it says in there. Whatever it says. All right. Now we're going to yeah, run a rule check. All right. Now uh, scan for product updates and let's let's just sit here and wait for this. So, so I'm going to actually make us sit through this because honestly, in my position, I hear a lot of um, nostalgia uh, for this time. And I don't know if people remember this time uh, as much as they think they do. I, right? I, th I think it's even harder when you have to do this for a client machine where they say, mm -hmm. oh, I need SSMS. Oh, mm -hmm. here's a full blown SQL Server installer for you. Yes, it's three gigs. <laughs> three gig download. I downloaded this earlier today. Uh, uh, so SQL Server features. I mean, I still don't see anything about SSMS, right? So I'm going to go next. Um, all right, now here we go. Now, now we're getting somewhere. Let's look through here. Let's do look through here. Here it is. Management tools complete. So and, and that's going to take uh, 1,300 megabytes. Uh, in order to get to that. And uh, it's going to go and install, uh, oh, I need to manually install the Microsoft.net oh, yeah. 3.5. Oh, okay, yeah. so. So now you have to I'm, back up. <laughs> back up. So this is about to fail on me, right? So yes. I'm actually gonna stop going through this here because I, I, I think I've made my point. I think that it's easy for us to forget the things that have improved and the ways that we have moved forward because we're not actually going back and doing that job anymore. We're not actually still running SQL 2014 set up in order to install SSMS. So I want to show you in comparison, like how, how do you install the tools today? So uh, let's say you do want SSMS. Uh, I'm just going to type download, SSMS download. And I just click here. Pull it up. And here it is, download S, uh, SSMS right here. Uh, so this was changed in 2016. And now SSMS releases more or less quarterly. Um, and it's independent of, of SQL Server. So this is just a, a, this is an example from my domain of how things have changed and I think for the better. But, but that does mean now, okay, SSMS is changing more often. I have to get up, you know, updates more often. I have to adjust my workflow around that. But, you know, I would ask to, to give some thought on, was it actually better when you didn't have that? Was it actually better when you had to wait until there was a new release of SQL Server to get an update to SSMS? I don't think it was. Um, and so let me also show you, you know, for those who aren't as familiar, you know, how would you get uh, Azure Data Studio? So let me pull over my Azure Data Studio. So Azure Data Studio, I can go to the Azure Data Studio download page. And so I can just download and install. Or I can go to GitHub where I'm able to look at all of the code for it. I can download the latest monthly release, release every month. I can download it for Windows. I can download it for Mac. I can download it for Linux. What do we uh, do before GitHub, right? Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> the, the, what, was, what was the name of that a code project? There were a bunch of various you know, ones, but and then here, I can even get the daily insiders build. This, this isn't even the daily build. This is every time that we do a build internal to the team. It goes out to the public just as well as it does to our internal users. Uh, you can go and see what everyone's working on. Uh, I can see, all right, here's the issues that are listed. I can see what, who's, you know, what is indi individual users uh, working on. Uh, I can see, uh, hey, what, what's being submitted right now? Like what pull requests are open? These are the actual bugs being fixed by whom and what. And this is all in public. And this is all, you know, changes that are being made right now. So this is, you know, I, I think, you know, let's celebrate a little bit that the pace of change requires new ways of thinking, but 
those new ways of thinking can be really exciting and, and they can be really uh, improvements over, you know, th this experience back here. So in, in terms of demos, I, I also just kind of wanted to give a sense for, for anyone who hasn't been using Azure Data Studio, uh, which, you know, I understand uh, SSMS has millions of users and, and they're really uh, familiar with it, but I, wa I want to show you a little bit about what Azure Data Studio is now. So Azure Data Studio is, is the new tooling um, that we are, you know, encouraging users to try out. And so this is, this is something that can cause a lot of discomfort. And I have I want to say again, huge empathy for that. When you have a tool that fits the hand, then you're not having to think about the tool. As soon as you have to start thinking about the tool again, you're you're going to feel that extra level of discomfort. But it's our intention to move this into a new set of tooling for the new set of problems that we have uh, as data users. And so if I think about my experience in SSMS, I'm going to go to database here. And let me go to wide world importers. Let me go to tasks. And look at this. So we had this issue where SSMS is a beautiful tool and it has a huge number of capabilities, but coming into this, you know, you're, it's a frog in boiling water, right? So if, if you had been with this for 15 years, then this is great. If I come into this as a new user who has been working with SQL Server for, you know, six weeks, this is unbelievable. This is so much to know and to know, oh, What's a data tier application? You know, how how is import flat file different from, you know, uh, a copy database? You know, how, what what is the difference amongst all of these things? And so, you know, one of the things that Azure Data Studio does do is it makes a lot of those things more optional. It makes it where you go to an extension marketplace and you say, what are the things that I actually want to do and have installed, and what are the things that I'm not working on, uh, and let's not install those. So in my environment now, whenever I go to Wide World Importers. I don't have as many things, but those are the things that I did choose. So virtualize data, create project from database, schema compare, import wizard, generate scripts. These are all things that I chose to install um, and that work with my workspace. The other thing that we have that's kind of adjusting to the new experience would be notebooks. So notebooks are an area that I think some people have taken to them and they, they really understand them and and get them and other people view them as a little bit more frightening. So notebooks are a concept that comes from the data science world where you can uh, combine human readable uh, markdown with with uh, your uh, code. So let me let me do kind of a query over here. So a new query. Hello. All right, so we select star from this databases. Run that, great. Now, if I hit Control S, what what am I going to save? Anybody? I'm going to save the SQL file, right? Yeah. It's but what happens to the results? How do I get the results out someplace? Save. You right click <laughs> results as. All right. Now, now this is this been like this for a really long time, but you know, let's step way back and say, isn't that a little odd? Like that all this time we've had this this really rich editing experience, and then the data that is so important to what we're doing is actually a right click save as CSV option. So it, it's actually something that I think that if you look at it kind of with fresh eyes, you say, well, why why was it ever this way? So let's take the same query. I'm going to just take it over here into Azure Data Studio and just do a new query again. And so this over here, this is about the same. So uh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to actually add a uh, select all databases. So let's run that on my local host distance machine. And so about the same. Um, and then over here, I can export, you know, save as Excel, save as XML, etc. But up here, I'm going to hit export as notebook. Let's see the same thing. So now I have select all databases here as a as a text cell. Select all star from sys.databases. Let's run this again against local hostess. Now I have the same experience, but if I control S save this, what I'm saving is the notebook. So let's say databases. I'll close that. 
over here, reopen it. And there I've got my results. So this is the, the fundamental of like how we're changing the tooling to change with the times. So now the the SSMS is you know very much aligned for people who are using this for quick throwaway queries and really focusing on the administration of the platform. This is designed more for people whose workflows have to do with ownership of the data and the data itself, the things that you found are is something that you're going to want to share with people and you're going to want to keep a record of. Um, and so the notebook, uh, you know, it's kind of fun to play with. You can do a lot of fun, you know, party tricks with with notebooks. If I do a, uh, you know, over here and I want to you know, decide to be fun with it, let's say, go over to the current. I have a hamster GIF over here, and I can pick a GIF and you know, copy that image. Go back over here and say I want to select all databases. And I want to be fun with it. You know, I can do this sort of thing with notebooks, and we talk about that a lot, and we kind of play with it a lot. But fundamentally, this is about the tooling changing to the changing needs of the uh, data professional. And so, I want to show you that, and then I want to kind of go through what I consider the changes that the data professional needs to look forward to moving forward uh, beyond just this list of platforms, and, and how I view us needing to change the tools. Uh, and these are the things I'm preparing for, you know, in our team. And so these are the things that I should think you'll be needing to prepare for by coming to things like group by and by um, participating in the larger, you know, community discussions. That was my my little demo. Certainly, if anybody has any questions about uh, the tooling, uh, I'm, I'm the right person. Let me know. Uh, but I'm going to kind of move back into to this. So another quote I like, those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. So I, I love that one, uh, George Bernard Shaw, and uh, that, that that whole concept that uh, if you are trying to be firm about things and say that your way is the right way and you won't change, then, then you, you're not gonna change, make any larger change in your organization or in the world. So I'm gonna ask that you, know, you consider becoming a champion for change uh, and and this is how you can kind of get past some of that discomfort around change and this is the way that you can get in front of uh, the the changes that are necessary in our uh, uh, industry so to, to me that that means basically three things you need to build yourself up uh, you need to lift up others and then you need to repeat it you need to understand that this is a continuous cycle of building up yourself, building up others, and repeating the process, and never getting entirely comfortable where you're at, looking forward to the next change, and, and looking forward to uh, the ways that you can help others to navigate that. So I'm going to step through a couple of the things that I consider the changes that you could use to build yourself up right now. So uh, I am seeing some chat. Somebody let me know if any of these are chats that I should be responding to, please. So when I talk about learning about the cloud, um, I know that a lot of people are still working in, in primarily on-premises environments. Uh, the reason I think you need to learn about the cloud, um, saying services, infrastructure, provisioning, security, costing, is that the day that comes that someone want, in your organization says, what's it gonna take to move to the cloud? You're either going to be the person who can answer that question or you're not. Um, and if you're not the person who can answer that question, that's another moment sort of like my sequel 2000 to 2005 moment to say can you be the person who they turn to and say hey what would it take to move us to the cloud and you say yeah this is this is i've kind of looked at this i think we have migration options these are the different costs these are the different uh, places that we might go and you can take it and you can run with it uh so and if you are in the cloud then you're talking about polycloud okay you know about your cloud you know about the other clouds do you know about the things that are coming out soon? Do you know how to operate in a multi-cloud environment? There's so much that you can do and the, the cloud is not going to be going away. This is going to become more and more vital and it's going to become more and more the case that people are actually cloud native and this is the first thing that they're learning. Um, and so, you know, first step I'd say in you're trying to make kind of a personal growth plan and preparing for change is to learn about the cloud. Uh, the next one that I want to call out is data privacy. So with data privacy, we've got 
um, GDPR and CCPA and other regulations coming along. Um, I, I put migration in here. I think that that actually belonged on the previous slide, so my bad. Um, we have data governance and auditing and, and the need for data masking, et cetera. This is, this is something that is already a big deal in some industries and in some countries and in certain organizations, and it's going to be getting bigger and bigger. So as people look to you uh, as a data expert, um, they're going to need you to be making choices about data privacy. And I say data privacy, and I, I kind of combine it with security uh, in that I'd say the, the ideal case would be that if your entire database was leaked, it would be okay because it has no private data in it, right? It, if, if it was completely uh, secure, if it was completely uh, encrypted, if it was completely uh, scrubbed, that's not necessarily the case. But you know, you can take a look at making sure that the data that you have uh, is, is in good hands and that your hands are the good hands. Um, learning to automate. So a lot of what uh, was kind of the bread and butter activities from, let's say, eight, eight years ago, 10 years ago, for the things that you would do every day are things that we've come to expect to be automated. So be things like backups. Uh, it, it would be high availability and disaster recovery options could also be provisioning, uh, CICD, uh, and the languages of those are not necessarily as stable as you might wish. So uh, a lot of people have learned PowerShell. Uh, Python and Bash are also getting to be really critical languages for uh, automation. And especially as you're moving into working with application developers, there may be application languages that you need to know as well. So I would say encourage you to learn some automation. Uh, learning the new tools. Now, this is you know me speaking on behalf of the tools team, saying uh, a lot comes out uh, of this team and it changes uh, quite quickly. So, uh, if I were to call out four things that I think everybody in the SQL Server space could probably learn use to learn about, would be notebooks, Azure Data Studio, MS SQL CLI, and the SQL Database projects. Um, SQL Database projects have actually been out for a long time in uh, Visual Studio. They're kind of getting a little shot on the arm right now in that they're being brought over cross-platform into Azure Data Studio. So um, MS SQL CLI is a interactive uh, and non-interactive command line tool that's kind of the, the new version of SQL CMD. Azure Data Studio, I just demonstrated, it's kind of the cross-platform tooling stack for, for SQL Server and beyond, you know, into Postgres and uh, uh, Azure Data Explorer. And of course, notebooks. Notebooks are something that uh, we're working in, investing in within the SQL Server tools across all of Azure data, across all data platforms that I know of. Um, they're, you know, within Python, within uh, .NET team, everyone is looking at notebooks as a new interaction method. And this would be something that I think you'd really benefit from learning about. And uh, then I'd also suggest learn a new platform. And uh, you have a lot of options on this, but uh, I, I really like something that my, music theory instructor told me once upon a time, which is that um, a lot of people know what they like, but they don't know why they like it. Um, and the taste is knowing why you like it. If you have been working only with the platforms that you have uh, some business need to work with, you might not be developing kind of the taste and the, the ability to discern and, and, and communicate differences amongst data platforms. So I'd encourage you to pick you know, one or two additional platforms learn about them, get familiar with them, be able to do some basic uh, activities with them. And uh, it, it will expand your uh, capability to, to weather changes as, as those come into your world. So, so Vicki, yeah. let me, I'm going to jump in really quickly um, before you get too far forward. Um, mm -hmm. What extensions did you have that allowed for backups and restores? Backup and restore is actually built into Azure Data Studio. That's considered a, a core ca capability. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, the, there, without getting off too, too deep into the weeds, um, when a data platform joins into Azure Data Studio, there are certain things that are expected. So the ability to be shown in the server tree, the ability to run queries, and the ability to backup and restore are kind of some of the things that we consider most data platforms are going to have. Some of the other things that are more optional, like SQL Server Agent, SQL Server Agent isn't something that's going to be relevant for someone who's using the tool for Postgres, and so it's it's more optional. Uh, so there's a lot of there, there's some little thin lines across the product that have to do with 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 that optionality. 
So the next thing I wanted to show was, all right, I just told you all of these things that I want you to learn. Uh, and there's more, and I'm sure everybody has their own personal wish list. So this is, uh, I want to teach you something called an Eisenhower box. And this is probably the thing that I cover most often whenever I'm doing individual mentoring and coaching sessions with people. So the Eisenhower box, you might have seen it called, uh, seen it before, heard it called it other things. Uh, it's basically a box that has on one axis urgency uh, for high and low, and it's got uh, on another axis uh, importance for high and low. So if you think about, you know, how would you uh, grid that out, it, it kind of gives you some sense of for any individual activity, what should you be trying to do? So for anything that is of high urgency and high importance, uh, you should do it now, you should do it immediately. It's, it's urgent, it's important, it's critical, this is clearly the thing you should be doing. Where people kind of, I think, struggle more is what if it's, oh, I think I have my, my, my uh, grids confused. Uh, yeah, so this is actually supposed to be high importance, low urgency. So I might actually have to change this around. Let me do a little bit of live dragging. There we go. I'm staring at this for too long. All right, so go back through this. So if it's low urgency, but high importance, you want to make sure that you have time to do it, right? So you have um, uh, things like what you're wanting to learn. Nobody's coming and, and knocking on your door and saying, you need to learn the cloud right now. Knock, knock, knock. You need to learn the new tools right now. But you need to make sure that it becomes something that you do. So you need to schedule time to do it. Uh, the next one would be uh, time boxing. So, uh, so this would be things that are high urgency, but of low importance. And, and the, the typical example of this would be uh, email. So people are emailing you constantly and they, or they're sending you chats constantly. Uh, there's endless amount of urgent stuff, but it's not typically that important. And so you give it, you know, I'm willing to spend two hours of this uh, on this per day and make sure that it doesn't overwhelm the things that are of low urgency, but high importance. And then finally, we have things that are of low urgency and low importance, which you just want to minimize entirely. Some people say delegate, some people say minimize. So uh, let's give some examples on this. And again, I'm going to fix my backwards slides. This is, we're all friends here, right? We can, we can weather a little bit of slide fixing. All right. So uh, on the things that I was uh, you know, mentioning on, yeah, yeah, my animation's going. So let's say uh, I talked about learning cloud, learning automation, privacy tooling and new platforms. You can decide some of these are urgent. I have an urgent business need to learn these immediately. So I'm going to do them immediately. Some of these others, I, I see that they're important. I believe you, but no one's asking me for it. So I'm gonna put them in the things that I'll schedule time for. So group by is a great example of this to say, I want to spend the time to attend a conference and learn more and expand my knowledge on these topics. And then whenever I get back to my regular day job, these are the topics that I'm actually going to be working on every day uh, because they're highly urgent. Now, to make room for these, you can reduce the time that you spend on the things that are of low importance. So I call out email and scheduled meetings here. Uh, these are things that will can absolutely rob of you of your time. I, I have an inbox that I will not show you right now, but I have over a thousand uh, scheduled meeting invitations and I will not be attending them. I will be attending some of them, but I will not be attending a thousand of them. And uh, so there is no upper limit to how much people will, will ask of you in terms of time in email and, and meetings. So if you want to be able to be a change yeah. agent, yeah, if you want to be a change agent, you need to take those things that are important to you and make them have time and take that time away from things that are not important. So. Um, and then finally, I wanted to cover a little bit about how to build others up. So this, this is, you know, if you're not in a position of being a manager, you might feel like uh, this isn't something you're able to do, but absolutely every one of us has the capability to build others up. And the things that I really want to call out here is that it's not about your ability and your position to direct the work of others. It's about you showing up every day with authenticity, uh, communicating with candor, uh, sharing a space of psychological safety with others and maintaining humility. This is something that I feel really important about and I, I'm really looking forward to uh, 
Andy's uh, discussion on diversity and inclusion, because I think that this is really mm -hmm. the same thing. This is about being authentically yourself, allowing the authenticity of others, speaking with kind candor to other people, and in doing so, creating this space where people can be themselves and build upon that. And so when I'm talking about candor, I'm saying that you need to communicate to others who are in one of those phases of flight, freezing, or fighting about changes in your industry. You need to be kindly candid with them that this isn't what you need to be doing with your time. You need to be growing. Here's what you can grow. Here's how you can grow. Here's how we can grow together. And you need to be able to be authentic with each other to say, I don't like this either. I, I don't feel comfortable with this either. I don't understand this new thing. I don't understand the reason for it. Or possibly even to say, I was excited about this. And once I started playing with it, I don't like it anymore. All of these things, this authenticity, it feels better. It's going to calm down your own nerves and it's going to help build others up. So uh, I, I ask this community, and this is a wonderful community, to consider this not only for um, navigating change to technology, but also navigating changes of other sorts. So we have changing um, you know, demographics in our teams. We have changing you know, young people coming in. We have people who are getting older. We have people with different abilities. Um, we have people who, you know, uh, have to interact with things differently. On my team, you know, we interact with people who do not have use of their hands, who do not have use of their eyes. Um, and you may come across that as well. Building up others um, isn't just about building them up for change. It's also building them up for their own success and your own success. So uh, I would really very much ask for you to consider that. And so um, with that, um, I, I really wanted to thank you all for, for kind of allowing me to go through a little bit of a wandering uh, discussion about my thoughts on change. Um, this is, you know, if we were to think about ourselves being pharmacists, I think we would all understand that, every, you know, there's new medications coming out all the time and we need to go take training on it. But we're in a field that, um, that is still building itself up. It's still learning itself and, and defining itself as a field. And um, some people who have entered this field may not have entered it knowing that they were entering into something like pharmacy where they need to change constantly, they need to learn constantly. But I, I congratulate you on being here uh, at Group I and, and becoming somebody who can grow, growing yourself and helping to lift others up. So uh, with that, I'd like to open it up for any Q&A. Okay, so I think I asked one of the questions mm -hmm. um, that was was up in there. Um, a lot of fun chatter about um, <laughs> SQL Server. Um, please insert disk two of 17. Yes. Um, yes. And somebody said, uh, <laughs> I've got, just I'll, I'll tell you, I've got, you know, my books right here still, you know? Yeah. Like they're all right <laughs> still up here. I, I, I remember those days. And somebody even said they're still waiting on ops to find the disc. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so they're not wrong. Um, I, a couple of great quotes in here that I thought you would like. Um, mm -hmm. One just got shared. Um, all progress requires change, but not all change is progress. It's entirely so, true. Right. Um, so, but no, I, I think people were like way too busy, you know, paying attention <laughs> and learning something to ask questions. So if you have one, if you have one, go ahead. Um, uh, somebody asks what's inside. Do you mean inside the book? <laughs> like, like a gun cut out? I don't know. <laughs> They're going to smuggle something into Microsoft in it. Um, <laughs> hey, Vicki, I, I, I have a question. Um, yes. Your last slide, you talked a little bit about psychological safety. And I'm mm -hmm. so curious about that. That's a relatively new term. Can you, okay. like, from, from, well, for me, in my journey, mm -hmm. um, can you unpack that a little bit in terms of how we can lift each other up and how you see that kind of changing the course of our careers and how we learn, especially yes. from each other? Yes, thank you for asking that. So um, the term psychological safety, I think, gained a lot of credence uh, uh, amongst like uh, management types because Google a couple years ago did a survey to see what, what was the thing that was 
you know, defining about their most capable and high performing teams. So was it age? Was it size? Was it, were they agile? Were they waterfall? You know, what, what was it that made a particular team more uh, productive and happy than other teams? And what they came out with was this concept of psychological safety, which is that uh, you hear the whole concept of you can bring your whole self to work. And uh, that, that has, uh, that can be difficult because some people don't want to share their whole selves at work. And, and sometimes when we say bring your whole self to work, we're, 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 not, we're kind of leading around other things. Psychological safety is to me more about the ability to put yourself out there on being right and being wrong and it being all right. I think that as a manager and as a team member, one of the most powerful things you can do to build team culture is to allow someone to see the moment when they change your mind. And to feel that safety to be able to challenge someone else and to be challenged by someone else, knowing that you're solving the problem and you're not attacking each other as individuals. Mm, mm -hmm. um, and so you have to have that. It's, it's, it's something deeper than teamwork. Uh, it has to be something to say, I think you're wrong. I think that's a bad idea. I don't think this is about you. I think this is about the idea. And also for you to be able to have incoming something to say, I don't think you gave enough thought to this and for you to be able to answer back and say, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. Please give me some time. So psychological safety and building that within the team is uh, simply the, you know, the act of being candid with each other over and over until you're, it's a habit in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Although as I, I think of what you're saying, I, I, I remember bosses who led the team by removing psychological safety, right? By deliberately making people feel on edge and uncomfortable and feel fear that if they messed up or if they didn't put in enough time or if they didn't do something else, then they would lose their job. Um, yeah. and, and every single example of that that I can think of over my longer than I want to admit career, those teams were not successful. Yeah. In the long run, maybe maybe short spurts of great productivity, and but everybody burned out, everybody hated each other, and eventually most people left. Mm. But mm -hmm. not the manager, like the people who worked for them. Well, no, because they took the credit. Um, but not the blame. Yeah, and there's exactly. also this, um, there's this book called uh, Radical Candor, and it's about the oh, axes yeah, yeah. Of, of communication, and mm -hmm. so some of it is about uh, there's the radical candor where you're being kind, but but giving people accurate information. Uh, and then you have um, ruinous empathy where you're being kind and you're not giving people necessary information. And then I can't remember the other two. There, there's one that's indifference uh, where you're, you're not neither giving information nor nor kindness. And then there's the basically the, the, the asshole quarter, which is where you're <laughs> you're giving information, but you're not you know, you don't build any empathy or any, uh, you're basically living on fear. The, uh -huh. One of the challenging things about that book is that it's actually better to be rude about giving information than to not give information at all. So you should be aiming for being kind and candid, but it's still better to be unkind and candid than it is to be kind and not Interesting. And just uh, not say anything. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I, I found that one it's kind of a challenging mm. read, actually, in that respect. Well, and it's so difficult now that we so many of us are remote because there's an element of like, like we don't really know what's going on with each other to the same extent as we did when we were in the office. And so creating a, like a really safe space to to give feedback, I think, is even more important. And it's showing us that we don't really know how to do it. We've just kind of been mm -hmm. getting by, 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 you know, guessing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like uh, how much, you know, have you kind of relied on team building just from being in a room with somebody or having, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, something like a meal to share. And, and so some of those things are important to teams and, and then other teams are like, Oh, you know, I've been remote all this time. It's been no problem. It's like, yes, but you, you built up that, that culture mm -hmm. in your team if, if it's a if it's the change if it's a sudden shift to say we had a way that we, we did things and we have a new way of doing things and you haven't built up that um communication path then you're going to suffer from it you're going to feel it now mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so I wanted to comment really quickly on one of the um, one of the comments that came up and it's JD Walker said he thinks another component of being psych of um, psychological safety at work is being able to be who you are at work um, that he feels that he has to censor who his who he is sometimes um, because even speaking in a normal tone of voice he has to be concerned about being the angry black man mm -hmm. and I, I totally empathize with it because because to a much lesser degree than he has to worry about it, I have to be concerned about being the woman who overreacts, right? She's being dramatic. She's being sensitive. So it's, it's, it's a still small, it's a smaller concern of mine than it probably is of JD's. But again, I would think that that has to do with who your bosses are and, and, and the culture that your company has built. Um, and, I, you know, I am confident JD can't fix that. Yeah, and that's that's why I say, you know, there's some difficulty. I have some difficulty. I don't know if it's very is, I'll not be passive voice. I have some difficulty with the term about bringing your whole self to work because I think people have completely valid reasons from trauma history that they can choose not to. And they can choose. Uh, now, we shouldn't be building cultures that require covering activity and for you to be having to hide who you are and for you to be having to change your tone of voice or being aware of it. But I also don't think that the people who are aware of those things from their own traumatic history are doing something wrong. You know, it's, it's incumbent on the people who are not experiencing those challenges to build the culture where the others can be, be safe, but not to require those people who have felt unsafe in the past to, to throw away everything that they know about their experience. And so that's, so, I find that challenging to, to balance, to say, how do you build something where you feel like somebody should be able to be their whole selves, but also respect that they are, um, they are wise to their own safety. It is less catchy, though, to say, bring as much of your whole self as you want to to work. Yes. It's a little wordier. Yes, so. exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. And, okay. and it is a matter of privilege. It, it honestly, truly is, because... Even in my position, you know, I'm, I'm a woman in tech, I'm in, in meetings many times when I'm the only woman in the room, but I've also been in this field for 20 years, and that's a different position from somebody else who is a new woman in tech, and that's a different position from someone who is an experienced person of color in tech or an inexperienced person of color in tech. Um, and so there, there's all of these micro privileges and intersections uh, of, of privilege to be aware of when you're building that culture. I could, I could probably do an entire topic on that, but I, I'm glad to know that Andy's gonna be talking about some of that. Uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, so Andy's talk is at 3.30 Pacific. Okay. So, um, so for those of you who are interested in talking more about inclusion and safety um, in the SQL Server community, I would love for you to join, um, join that and we can kind of continue that uh, continue talking about that conversation later. Mm -hmm. um, there was one question here. Are there any plans for ADS support of MySQL? So I feel comfortable telling you that yes, that is our most upvoted request. And so I have actually got, a, I think I showed it at SQL Bits. Uh, I've actually got a, a, a developer version of that. We just don't have a release plan for it yet. So we're we're working on it. So uh, you can see that Azure Data Studio is really intended. This is one of the ways in which it is different from SSMS. There's always this question of, oh, is that ADS going to replace SSMS? So like, well, SSMS is never going to have uh, MySQL and Postgres support. I can, I can tell you that uh, Azure Data Studio will. And so it's moving off in that, in that direction of kind of the polyglot, polycloud, poly, you know, hybrid uh, uh, on-prem and cloud world that involves bringing in additional data platforms. Uh, I can't give a promise to exactly when it's going to happen, but we, we are actively working on it. Great. Um, so Keith, Keith Brockman has a question here. Mm -hmm. It's more specifically about notebooks. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, is notebooks an independent tool or is that something within Azure Data Studio? That's a wonderful question. So I, I kind of hit upon it very lightly, but notebooks are, well, when, we, when I talk about notebooks, uh, the notebooks we use are called Jupyter Notebooks, and Jupyter uh, Notebooks are kind of a standard file format uh, that uses a Jupyter server to execute. Uh, so the what you have in Azure Data Studio is a viewer for Jupyter Notebooks. So it 
the look and feel of it, the exact way that copy paste works, the exact way that the drop downs look, et cetera, is to Azure Data Studio. But that same file format, that IPYMB file, I could open it in a generic, you know, open source Jupyter, you know, non, non Azure Data Studio open source Jupyter editor. I could open it in a different commercial tool. I could open it in GitHub or in VS Code or in any other, other number of tools. Um, and then the ability to run it has to do with the availability of that execution kernel. So in a notebook, you have kind of the, the concept of the file, which has the result sets and everything in it, which is very portable. And then the kernel would be uh, essentially the drivers and the uh, information necessary to connect to something. So like the SQL kernel in Azure Data Studio knows how to connect to SQL servers on port 1433 and to navigate all of the, uh, the communications protocols, security protocols, et cetera. And so if you were to be running that on something like Google Colab, which is another notebook editor, and it doesn't have a SQL kernel, then it wouldn't be able to execute that notebook, but it, it would be able to view it. So when I say to kind of maybe learn about notebooks, there's these couple little concepts around what's a kernel, you know, what's the uh, language, how do you pick the language that you're using, and then what are what's the difference between the editor and a server. Uh, but then beyond that, it is definitely a highly portable concept. Great. So I, I think I think we got all of the questions. I'm scrolling back really quickly. We're getting a lot of thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh yes, right. no, thank you. And I, I want to thank out, you because heading out to lunch. Um, <laughs> yeah, because it's it's interesting to know what's the right you know what's the right thing to bring to a top to a online uh, conference like this. A, a keynote has this concept of you standing up on a stage and kind of being separated from other people, and and I don't think that, that makes sense, you know, in, in in for group buy and for the time that we're in and for the the topics particularly. So I appreciate everybody's uh, kind.